I don't know if you've noticed or not, but there is just so much hatred going around in the world right now. You just turn on the news, you look outside. There's just so much violence. I was reading this morning that last night in Portland, they're uh, burning flags and they're burning Bibles, having these big bonfires. And, you know, that's not an isolated incident. You can look at all kinds of different news things. And it's just like, it seems like the world has gone crazy. The world's gone nuts. Uh, there's so much violence. Everything's politicized. And so many people have different opinions. And, and for a lot of people, if, if your opinion is different than mine, then, then, then you're just an evil person and you're a bigot. And it's like, man, what is going on? In this, so, in this culture that we live in, we are also quick to vilify each other. Now, what if I told you if that we, we're in a battle... We, we know that we're in a battle. I don't, I don't have to convince you that. But what if I told you that many times we're fighting the wrong enemy? What, what would you say? We're going to start a new series this morning, a little mini-series mini uh, through this letter of Ephesians. Uh, so if you've got your Bible, we'll be in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, starting in verse 10. We'll get there here in just a second. But we're calling this spiritual warfare. Because while we are in a war, while we're in a battle... I'm convinced that many times we're fighting the wrong enemy. See, when we get distracted by everything else that's going on, we can easily lose sight of the real enemy and the things that he's doing in the world. And part of fighting a war, all right, is making sure that you're prepared. Jesus talks about this during his ministry when he talks about discipleship. He said, hey, but before you make a commitment, man, you better, you better think long and hard about it. He said, no, no, uh, no commander gets his army involved in a war without first kind of counting the cost and looking at everything and seeing if he ought to not go and make, try to make peace with the guy before he tries to fight, because if he doesn't, he's going to get overwhelmed. See, no, nobody goes to war without seriously considering everything first. In fact, some of the biggest military blunders in history have occurred because people either didn't pay attention to scouting reports or because they... they um, uh, they, they misjudged their opponent. They didn't take them seriously. Uh, you know, Custer's last stand comes to mind. See, there's a whole lot to consider before you go to war. You've got to know who the real enemy is. You've got to make sure you target the right people. Part of fighting a battle is also making sure you're equipped with the right gear. I mean, you don't, you don't want to bring a gun to a knife fight. Like, you you want to know what, what's going on. You want to make sure that you have the equipment that you need to win the battle. And finally, you've got to have the right battle plan. You've got to have the right strategy. And if we forget about any of those preparations, or if we prepare incorrectly, it can have disastrous consequences. You can look throughout history. I did this a little bit this week, just at different military blunders and, and thousands of lives that have been lost just because... People didn't prepare correctly or people targeted the wrong enemy. Their, their targeting systems malfunctioned and said that their friends were actually their enemies. And so, uh, you know, friendly fire claimed a lot of people. And it's just battle after battle from as, as far back as we can look, there, there have been blunders because we didn't prepare correctly. I want to tackle all three of these um, different preparations, you know, the right enemy, the right, the right equipment, and the and the right strategy over the next few weeks here um, in Ephesians as we close out this letter. But in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, here, here's what Paul says. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. See, Paul starts out this section with the word finally, meaning that, that it's connected to everything else, and it's especially connected to chapter 3. And he's meaning, hey, after everything else, after everything that I've, that I've read or that I've written that you've read, that you've put into practice, do this. Don't forget about this. Take special note of this. And he says, be strong. But he doesn't say to be strong in your own power. He doesn't say that this is a battle that, that, that we can win if, if we work out enough, if, if we just know what to do. He said, no, don't, don't, don't be strong in yourself at all. Don't, don't think that you can do anything. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. That This is a victory that God has ultimately already won. 
See, there is an enemy, but it's not the enemy we often choose to fight. And when we choose to fight amongst ourselves, we we help the enemy spread even more discord. But I want you to make no mistake, there is an enemy out there. And that enemy is what we call the devil. The devil was once this all-powerful angel who decided that his position wasn't enough for him. He, He looked at God and he wanted what was God's. He wanted to be God, and in his pride, he was cast out of heaven. And many angels followed after him. These angels all had free will. They they chose to follow after the devil. And these angels become what we know uh, today as demons. And the devil and these demons, they have limited power on the earth. At the end of the day, they didn't want to submit to God. And when we refuse to submit to God or to the structures that he set up, we follow right along in their rebellion. And I don't think it's a coincidence at all that right before Paul mentions the enemy, he's just gotten done talking about our submission in different situations. See, there's absolutely no way to follow Christ that doesn't include our submission to Christ. And Satan and his demons, their time is limited. They know that their time is limited, and they're trying to cause all the mayhem that they can until they're confined for eternity in hell. See, hell was actually created for the devil and his angels. And then all those who follow after the way of the devil will also be cast into hell, but it was created to be the final destination for the the devil and for all who followed after him. I mean, that, that should kind of make us unsettled a little bit, I think. I mean, it should make us uncomfortable, I mean, make no mistake, there is a real enemy, and there is a real hell. Like, these aren't just scare tactics made up to frighten people. Jesus believed in hell. Jesus taught about hell. Jesus cast out demons from a whole lot of people in the Gospels. I mean, he's regularly, everywhere he goes, he's casting out demons from people. Folks, they they, they didn't go away. Jesus believed in hell, and he regularly taught about hell. And in our sophisticated world right now, it's not popular to believe in the existence of Satan and demons. I remember several years ago, on, it was on primetime TV one night, I was watching a, a famous pastor and uh, Deepak Chopra debating on the existence of the devil. Like, they were sitting down having like a, a debate about whether or not the devil was real. See, we don't want to believe in the devil because we don't want to believe in God. If we admitted the existence of the devil, logic follows that people might have to actually admit that there's a God. And we don't want to do that. See, we want to believe that guns are the problem. Or we want to believe that the police are the problem. Or we want to believe that racists are the problem. We we want to believe that Democrats and Republicans are the problem. And so what we do is we try and create all kinds of social programs to fix the problems that ail our society. And we get frustrated when they don't work. We, we freak out. We want to get rid of guns because we think if we do that, people will stop killing each other. We, we want to get rid of all evidences of slavery because if we do that, then people will treat each other right. We, we want to get rid of the police because if we don't have to submit to them, then everything will be fine. See, we forget or, or maybe we refuse to acknowledge that there is an actual enemy bent on our destruction And fixing our problems on just a human level will never work because the solutions never go deep enough. They they can't go deep enough. But at the end of the day, there is this real enemy who wants nothing more than to destroy you. And we're fighting the wrong war, I'm convinced, on the wrong front against the wrong enemy. It says in 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. All right, Peter had no doubt that, that there was a real enemy who was bent on our destruction, and he tells his readers to be alert and to be of sober mind. In other words, he says, pay attention to what's going on. Don't get distracted by everything else that's happening. Don't be controlled. Pay attention. And I think distraction is a huge tactic of the enemy, especially in our world right now. You know, there's all kinds of things to be distracted about. We got, we got a virus, we got police, we got politics, we got an election year. You just keep going. There's all kinds of things to distract us right now. So the first step of preparation is to acknowledge that there's an enemy and that he wants to destroy you. 
See, and sometimes our problem isn't that we refuse to believe in the enemy. It's that we think we're strong enough to take on the enemy by ourselves, and we don't give much thought to anything else. We treat kind of the name of Jesus as if it were magic. You know, scripture shows us what can happen when we do that. There's this, there's this passage uh, in Acts chapter 19. We won't read it, but it, it's, it's a passage about how the gospel is spreading through Paul, and, and Paul's getting famous, and he's making Jesus famous. And uh, seven sons of Sceva, uh, that's the name of a Jewish chief priest, they, they hear about this. They think, oh, well, if Paul's out there doing this, then, then we can do this too, right? And so they, they come up to a, to a demon. They say, hey, in, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, like not, not who we preach, but in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, you know, come, come out of this guy. And the, the, the demons just beat up these seven sons of Sceva so, so bad that they leave the house naked and bleeding. Like it's one thing if you get in a fight and you get a bloody nose, but if you lose your pants, like that, that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole other thing, all right? Like that's, that's a bad deal. But, but they just treated the name of Jesus as if it were some kind of a magic you know, spell that they could use. Just say Jesus, and the demons are going to go, wait, man, they, they beat him up. It was a bad day for them. That's how a lot of our horror movies um, treat, treat uh, Jesus. Like just hold up a cross, say, say Jesus with enough guts, so gusto, and, and the demons will have to obey. But look at how Jesus himself responded when he was tempted by the devil. Like, he, he didn't do any of that. You, you can read in the Gospels, and immediately after Jesus is baptized, the Spirit leads him off into the wilderness for 40 days, where, where he fasts for that time. And then the devil comes, and he tempts him. We have three recorded temptations. I, I believe there are probably more, and we just have kind of the highlights. But he comes to Jesus when he's at one of his weakest moments, and, and he starts trying to get him to cast doubt on the Word of God, and, and the devil even quotes Scripture at Jesus. And what, what does Jesus do every time? Do you remember? He quotes scripture at him. He, he, every time he quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, any time that Satan tried to get Jesus to cast doubt on the word, Jesus fires right back at him with the word. Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, Paul doesn't tell us just to put on armor. He says, put on the armor of God. And this is important because it's not a physical enemy that we're facing. We, we don't fight spiritual battles with physical means. You know, you, we can't pick up a sword and fight the devil. All right, we can't pick up a rifle and fight off a demon. And we, and we can't use a keyboard to attack somebody who disagrees with us and thinks that it's winning a war. Do you want to know why all of this stuff that we keep seeing on the news every day doesn't work? Do you want to know why all the protesting won't work? Why all the rioting won't work? Why, why no matter what the outcome of the election is in November, that things will still be broken? Paul tells us in verse 12 of Ephesians 6. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, in the heavenly realms. See, the tactics that we use, the protesting, the changing the laws, the defunding the police, whatever, you can keep going, they don't work because we're fighting the wrong enemy on the wrong front with the wrong equipment. And until we face the right enemy on the right front with the right equipment, all of these things will continue to fail. But the first step before we can do anything else is to make sure we know who the right enemy is. Because if we don't know who the right enemy is, we're going to be fighting against the wrong enemy. Pretty simple, right? When we put it like that. Paul continues to spell it out pretty clearly here. Our battle is not against people. It's not against flesh and blood. But if our enemy isn't flesh and blood, you know, kind of who we can clearly see in front of us with our eyes, who is it? Is it an invisible enemy? No, it's a spiritual enemy. But make no mistake, just because it's spiritual doesn't mean that it's not real. One of my favorite passages in the Old Testament shows us this reality of the spiritual world in the midst of our physical world. And it's out of 2 Kings chapter 6, and it's a passage dealing with the ministry of Elisha, the prophet. And Elisha's got a certain king mad at him because he's been preaching, and this king is mad, and he wants to go, and he wants to, to find Elisha, and he wants to attack him. And here's what it says in 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 13. 
The king says, go, find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back. He's in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Huh. And Elisha prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. I think one of the biggest task, tactics of the enemy is to make you think there is no enemy. We live in this world that wants to deny the supernatural. Like, like even in many churches, like the Holy Spirit isn't allowed to show up if it's not already in the bulletin. But just as we live in this physical world that, that we can see and taste and we can touch, there's a spiritual world that's just as real. And if we could see it all the time, like Elisha's servant got to see, I think we'd go out of our minds. So Paul tells the Ephesians, hey, there is an enemy. You are at war. It just might not be the enemy that you can physically see with your eyes. Now, the people you can see with your eyes who are doing evil things, even though they not, may not ultimately be your enemy, they're probably being used by your enemy. They're probably deceived by your enemy. It says that the real enemy is the devil as well as these rulers, these authorities, these powers of the dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. All right, but most of us probably read that and kind of go past it. Like, well, I don't really know who those people are. We'll just go to the next verse. But if you recall in Ephesians chapter 3, starting in verse 8, Paul wrote this about the church. He says, although I'm less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ and to make, known, and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, it's my belief that the enemies that Paul is referring to here are none other than the devil and the angels who decided to follow after him, who became demons. Throughout the timeline of history, God has been showing them how good and glorious he is. He's been taking human beings who have absolutely no supernatural powers, and he's been using them to advance the church all throughout the world. He's been using sinful humans whom he's chosen to inhabit with his Holy Spirit to spread the message of the gospel all over the world. And the devil and these demons, they do have some powers, all right? But at the end of the day, they are ultimately powerless to stop what God has done through Christ and his church. I mean, they, they can cause some minor interference, but, but they can't stop what God the Father has set into motion, which he planned from eternity past. See, the devil wanted what was God's. And so it's almost as if God said, you think you're powerful? L let me show you how powerless you really are. And then he uses human beings to accomplish his will. Like he chooses to redeem humans. There's no salvation opportunity whatsoever for the devil and his angels. Yet there is for us. Do you ever think about that? Like, do you ever wake up in the night and just marvel over the fact that God chose you? Like, if we really, if we really understood what God was doing through the church, I think many of the problems that we think we had in the church would disappear. And I'm talking about the church at large. Listen to how Paul describes what God has done to the Colossians. It says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You and I... If we're in Christ, we get to be part of this cosmic lesson that God is teaching to those who refuse to submit to his will and to his reign. All they can do is watch and fight against it, but you and I get to have an active part in it. And so having recognized the right enemy, Paul, Paul says this in, in Ephesians 6, 13. He says, therefore, put on the full armor of a God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground 
And after you have done everything, to stand. Therefore, all right, because the enemy is spiritual, we need the armor of God. We don't need the armor of man. He'll outline what that armor looks like um, in the next set of verses, which we'll unpack next week. And he says to stand your ground. And standing your ground means just that. It means you stand and you don't give any ground to the enemy. Is this by our own power? No. Remember what Paul said in 6.10. He says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. God's already won the war. Now he tells us to stand firm in the full armor of God. It's already available to us. Much like earlier in Ephesians 4, he tells us to put on the new self. Now he says to put on the full armor of God. And I personally believe that this stand is taken every day that we're alive. Every day that we're alive, we have this opportunity to stand. But the only way we can truly stand is to know who and what we're fighting against. It's not the person sitting in front of the computer monitor across the world. It's not the police officer. It's not the protester. It's not the Republican. It's not the Democrat. It's not the president. Now, those people and loads of others may be tools of the enemy at times. They may be, end up being used by the enemy, but they're ultimately not the enemy. The enemy is the same enemy that showed up in Genesis chapter 3. And he tried to plant doubt against the word of God. It's the same enemy who came to Jesus while he was at a weak point. He tried to get him to doubt the word of God. Don't let him distract or confuse you as you daily follow Christ. Know this book so that you can understand his tactics, so that you can recognize him. Don't make the mistake of underestimating your enemy. There is a war. God's already ultimately won through the death and resurrection of Christ. But until Jesus returns and until the devil and all of his angels are thrown into hell, it's up to us to stand. Will you pray with me? 